Dear participants, still here in the room or wherever remote, welcome for this last session of uh, this year's Basel Peace Forum, the so-called panel of the day. Uh, my name is Laurent. Uh, I think I've introduced myself already a couple of times. And uh, I will not be much longer with my uh, three uh, uh, present uh, co-panelists uh, here. You've also seen them um, before. Uh, Branka Panic, just to my right, um, um, uh, Omaid Sharifi in the middle, and uh, Günther Bechler to the far right. Günther Bechler, um, uh, a mediator, Omaid uh, Sharifi, an artivist, and um, uh, Branka Panic, an academic and uh, active person in the field of artificial intelligence uh, for peace. And last but uh, not least, um, um, Fatou Vouri, whom you see on the screen um, uh, behind of us and uh, the remote persons on your, on your screen. Um, uh, she's joining in, social scientist from uh, Sierra Leone with a long work experience also in this field. So welcome uh, to all of you uh, for this uh, last panel. And the idea of this session is to bring together certain elements which were discussed uh, today in different formats and uh, uh, to have some distance towards these uh, insights, to try to bring them into a certain relation and maybe also to look a little bit ahead and to broaden our perspective. So the overarching topic of the day were emotions. I hope you have all realized this uh, by now. And um, uh, we, we discussed a lot about uh, specific constellation situations in which uh, emotions play a role. And uh, it is now, I think, not the place anymore to take up the question if emotions are relevant or not. Uh, I think we, we agree they play a role. We probably already had a slight idea that we would get to this conclusion when we, when we labeled the overarching topic of this day, emotions. However, the question is, how do emotions uh, come in? And uh, particularly uh, when we look at uh, the different fields which uh, were present in different formats today, social media, arts, fake news, mediation, I think this was more or less uh, the range. So to start the discussion, um, uh, I would like to make a few, how to say, statements or a thesis saying that emotions come in in different ways regarding their impact depending on the field we are looking at. If we take arts, people will tend to see emotions as positive. So the more emotions we have, the better for this field regarding the influence emotions arts could have on politics and on peace. However, if we turn to the whole thematic area of social media, fake news and so on, emotions tend to be seen as having a negative impact. So the less emotions we would manage to have in there, the better it would be for peace. And mediation, well, mediation is a bit boring, as we could see this afternoon. It's always somewhere in the middle, so they don't know if emotions really matter or not. <laughs> and, uh, but we may also want to look a little bit deeper into this issue on this panel. So I think we are all set, yes? And, um, uh, well, Omaid, you look fully ready to give I an answer. <laughs> what do you say? Are in the field of art emotions always positively connotated? I mean, so the more of them in your field, the better it will be in regard to peace and successes. Uh, thanks, Laurent. Yeah, um, yes, more emotions. Uh, it is the better. Um, I think when we are creating a piece of art, it comes from within. It comes from a lot of emotions. It is an extension of you, whatever you're creating. And especially when we are talking about the work of art lords and what we do on the streets of the world or the streets of Afghanistan, it usually takes two persons. So one that we create this piece of work with our emotions 
and also the spectator, the person who comes and paints with us, we want to spark and evoke some emotions in them as well. What is their response when they see or they engage in this piece of work? We had a small exercise today on the other room where we painted together. For me, creating this piece of art was very emotional because I was talking about 15 million Afghan female women and, and kids who cannot go to school, who are in prison at their homes. So for me, it was very emotional to bring this message to this platform. And then when the people were coming over to paint with us, and when I was talking about this and explaining why we are doing this, and I asking them to write a message to this girl who is sitting in the middle of this painting. So I saw that it was evoking so many emotions inside these people as well. So more emotions, it's more important. It, it, it makes it beautiful. Uh, at the same time, sometimes the emotions could be very positive to our liking. It evokes, you see a beautiful painting, you, you, you like it, you love it, you're in awe. But sometimes it could be very negative as well. Like this message, this artwork that we created could be very painful for some people. If there was an Avon audience in this setting and if it was a female Avon, it would be very painful for them to just know that what is happening to the women of Afghanistan. Or you go to a museum or see a, a picture of a massacre or a genocide or something like that. So it could be both positive emotions and negative emotions. But I think for us creating those pieces of art, it's very important to have those emotions and involve those emotions. It makes it more genuine, it makes it more real, it makes the connection with the spectator, with the audience more. Thank you very much, um, Omaid. Fatu, <coughs> now you had some minutes to reflect. What do you say? Thank you. I say whose emotion, right? <clears throat> I mean, we were talking about chatbots and technology at the nexus of peace building, humanitarian action and development. And so when I think of myself as a customer going to try to return a pair of shoes or clothes online and I meet a chatbot, I come in already angry and frazzled and the job of that chatbot and the way it's designed is to ensure that I am, it's neutral, right? It's, it's calming. It acknowledges my frustrations and at the same time, it's helping me navigate to get my problems so sorted, my very trivial problem in the bigger scheme of things. But in the area of where I work, which is humanitarian action, um, dealing with the most precarious situations and seeing people um, barely with a shred of or, or fighting for their dignity and their livelihood and their lives, emotions are charged, they're everything. And so when I use technology via SMS or a social media platform to that user, to that person that already has the privilege to have access to be connected to, 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 the, to the telephone or uh, can receive and read messages or has access to social media to be able to get information, information that can literally save their lives, whether it was, you know, when I was fighting at the front lines of the Ebola response or what we developed in New York for the COVID response globally, especially in the global south, the knowledge and the information we provide must be sound, but the way in which we tell that story, the human face that is interacting with people who need the information that could potentially save their lives, uh, it's, it's a meeting of, of many emotions. Um, and it's really at the core of it, at the core of it, it's about dignity and being fully seen. So how we communicate is what really mediates or what really um, gestates or encapsulates or soothes someone based on where they are, their geographical location, their economic disposition, their racial uh, 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 embodiment, and all these other things. So it is we, we cannot underestimate and assume that things like technology or social media uh, are neutral. They're not. They're everything but neutral. They're incredibly charged for the better or for worse. Thank you very much, uh, Fatou. Um, uh, yes. <clears throat> Branka? Can't agree more, Fatou. And, Don't and agree too much. <laughs> Not too uh, much. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at this point, I will actually maybe be a bit biased toward arts. Uh, and just because I'm still taking this emotion with me now, because I just saw the, the mural, uh, and I knew that uh, our colleagues will be creating something. I didn't know exactly what that will be. And just, I didn't even know the location. So just accidentally, you know, I ended up 
in front of this amazing piece of art. And this is where the emotions are. And I truly believe that there is no peace without art. And in that sense, there is no peace without emotions as well. Sometimes they will be charged in this way, sometimes in that way. I do truly think we need to uh, embrace this. And again, this art piece, please go in the other room. Uh, I hope our audiences online will also be able just to experience this in a, in a certain uh, way. It brought a lot of emotions to me as well because through uh, my own experience as a kid, I was not able to go to school because of the bombing of Belgrade. So that was a part of life that I went through. I think that it made me a stronger person. So what I put out there is strength, just hoping to get that message out there and, and somehow collectively with this forum as peace builders, I hope that we can somehow pass this message of, of strength, of peace, of, of support. Um, now to jump into my role of, of a technologist and, and somebody who is trying really to, to bring this message through the tools of, of the technology as well, things it's really hard to put them in either black or white. There will always be the tools that will be misused, and we talked uh, for, for uh, people who followed the panel that I participated in today, we talked about this negative side of, of hate speech and, and fake news. Um, uh, with, with Fatu now I'm connecting, like I really think there are so many beneficial ways that we can utilize these technologies and, and uh, come into this uh, field actively. So let's let's take the ownership out there and as peace builders make sure that we use these tools that we have to actually create more peaceful uh, societies. Thank you very much, Branka. We'll get back to it afterwards. Um, um, Gunther, um, uh, Fatu said, well, it's a lot about the way emotions, mm -hmm. messages are being communicated also in regard to the, this wasn't Fatu's word, but I'm using it uh, in regard to the target audience. Yeah. So these are elements which are also very present and, and, uh, and important in, in mediation. So all in all, now you're not fighting with Antje, you're, you're <laughs> discussing with us. How do you see it? <laughs> yes, I must say, um, in the mediation process, when you mediate and moderate, I think the art of mediation is really to address emotions that might be very negative in a, in a transformative, in a proper way. This is not easy, actually, when you do it, uh, because there are many elements. You can even... Uh, contribute to uh, the heightening of tensions with wrong interventions from your side. You may do uh, a wrong interpretation of a statement, reframing you may not really handle well, and so you can create emotions uh, in a very negative sense that adds to the tensions instead of using them in a constructive way to transform the relationship. So for me, it's really the art of mediation when you are sitting around the table to, to address this in a proper way. And I think it's not easy. You need a lot of um, experience, uh, maybe training. Uh, and also you have to be with the people around the table. Otherwise, you will not manage. In that sense, I think uh, emotions can negatively impact on the process. So it's also your role to turn this around, you know, to make it a resource for solution and not a resource for tension. And this morning, we went to the exhibition of uh, the posters of Picasso, and there was a very nice quote of Picasso saying that, you know, you may think about a painting, what you're going to paint, but only when you start and when you paint, you know what the result is going to be and how it looks like. You know? And I think it's a bit the same in the mediation. And that's why, among other things, I'm a, I'm a co-founder of a foundation. It's called Art as Foundation of Peace. 
And very concretely, we went to some IDP camps with art students to live with the IDPs in the households, in the small houses, and to produce art in the sense uh, that it was an interaction between the IDPs and the art students for 10 days in a row. And what was interesting, in particular, the women in these IDP camps, they said, this is the first time in 15 years that somebody comes to our camp and asks us what we experienced during the war and as IDPs and refugees and how we feel now after 15 years in an IDP camp. So please come back. And I think this was in the sense of a multi-track approach, what we discussed before, uh, extremely um, touchy in a way how they reacted on this uh, linkage between art and peace building. If we now extrapolate a little bit, um, uh, today in Geneva, two foreign ministers met of two larger states. So if we would take them to such a, an art camp, things would change? Or might, if you were able to meet Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Blinken and to paint a mural, now not in, in, in Kabul, uh, let's be half realistic, yeah? Um, uh, in Geneva, yeah? You would not be with us in Basel now here, you would be in Geneva, along the lake somewhere, and um, uh, uh, Let's imagine they would be there and they would be painting with you. Do you see any opening that it would have an impact? Oh, certainly. Um, there has been many cases where we have been to many conferences that the different sites um, uh, are on the table. And the moment they get out of that table and they have an opportunity to come together and paint on a canvas and whatever it is, you see that they're putting their guards down. Whatever that's stopping them from having a good conversation. So they, for a moment, they just put those guards down. They smile. More of the times, I have realized um, they have more power to listen to each other, not just hear, but just listen to what the other part says. And then this gives them also an opportunity to be on the same page paint something about Ukraine or about Crimea or Donbass or whatever it is. Or even I, I, when the Americans and the Taliban were having negotiations in Doha, we had a recommendation that it's a year long of conversation sitting on the same table and the moment they're getting out, they could just start painting something, I don't know, verses of Quran or whatever, because it really helps them calm down. Painting a mural is a therapy for them because I'm sure there's so much pressure on their minds. Uh, so I think uh, definitely we are not giving much thought and importance to art and painting and music. And the moment you bring it to a setting like this, um, you missed a lot on the other room. The moment our friend from South Korea started painting, uh, playing the violin, and the moment our cartoonist from Utopia started showing the cartoons and started doing cartoons with the people, and the moment we started painting, the whole environment changed. We had more conversation. We were listening to each other. We knew each other more. We knew each other's names. Mm. We knew each other's work. So I think it, it brings a lot to the table uh, when it comes to art and then mixing it with politics and peace building. Can I just quickly yes. connect on yes. this? Because for the audiences who are online, uh, we had a parallel sessions and parallel to this one was another one, so not intentionally connected, but because of the open space, we were able to hear the sound of the violin and the things that are, had the energy from your room. So I think this is another important message as well, and this is kudos to the organizers as well for picking this location, for picking these topics, because sometimes you don't, you don't even intentionally create these synergies mm. and energies, right? So we were able to discuss uh, uh, another important peace-building efforts through another 
uh, form of media through uh, uh, radio or TV shows, and then suddenly we heard this sound of violin happening and this energy from the other. So immediately you get this experience of mm -hmm. another level of emotion, right? But on the, on the other side, this unintended impact that you are creating. So just to connect on the art side of the story, I would love to see politicians more involved in these kind of participatory uh, creations, but there is another uh, level of impact, as you mentioned at the beginning, as you are only a, spectat a spectator, mm -hmm. right? So even if they're not in intentionally involved in the creation process, politicians are looking and they are seeing the things that are happening in the art field. When we, talk, we talked yesterday about the street mm. art in so many cities across the world, and many of them conflict. It doesn't even have to be war, right? Mm. There are many types of conflicts and, and uh, negativi negativities that are happening between populations. When you see art sending messages, you see that politicians are caring. In many cases, even painting things down. Yeah. We remember things of burning the books, right? Or different, even to be technology, when we talk, like we see in Nigeria, the government shutting down the Twitter, uh, you know, we see these movements of trying to push back because this is a powerful tool. Uh, so kudos again to, <laughs> we, yeah, we, we did <laughs> to a organizers. <laughs> we did a mural, it was called seven years ago, I See You. So this mural was right across the presidential palace hmm. uh, in Afghanistan. And every time the vice president was passing by, so he would see this mural. And this vice president was corrupt. So many members of our parliament was corrupt. And we knew that, but we couldn't do anything. One day this vice president told me, every time I would pass by this mural, I would count with myself. This minister is corrupt, this parliamentarian is corrupt, this uh, businessman is corrupt. And then eventually this guy, honestly, he told me that he would, he would not pass by this mural anymore. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it, subconsciously he was ashamed and he knew that he was passing by this mural in the morning at 8 o'clock and at 10 o'clock he would get some bribes of $100,000 and they would remember that <laughs> at least Omeda see, I'm seeing you, mm. I know you're stealing my money, I cannot do anything now but eventually we will talk about it, we will take you to justice. So it definitely has an impact when these guys just only pass by these murals. Yeah. Um, and somehow we had an exhibition of artworks when these two guys were meeting in Geneva I'm sure the emotions would be very different. Mm. Fatu, when you listen to us, of course you belong to the part of the participants, speakers in this forum who didn't have the opportunity to just go and have a look at the neighboring room. But still, what do you think? What are your reactions? I am sitting here genuinely smiling because of the energy that I can see um, mm -hmm. in the room the one of, of connection. And so even though I'm here virtually and the last two years as a globe, we've been so separated. Most of us are now on Zoom calls. Uh, we are told to spend six feet apart from each other. The human connection is so important. It's, and so when you ask the, emo the question around emotions, I think as I'm sitting here watching the three speakers just banter and really enjoy and, 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 and share space with one another and are impressed and are, are, are graced by each other's space, even though I'm not there physically, I feel that all the all the, the the commentary and the, the the stories around the power of art as healing art as communication art as accountability art as connecting with another human being uh, for a shared vision all of these things sip into all of our work we all come from different sectors but what builds what brings us all together is this idea of human connection and we can never forget that in my work as a social justice advocate working in multilateral systems, it's very easy to be performative. It's very easy, you know, coming from the place I come from, which is a very small country in Sierra Leone that has had 11 years of war and to really be part of, uh, to evade a, a, a statistic um, of having left my country to be able to have the privileges that I have. I am constantly in a world where in the ego, 
right, is, is what performs. It's this idea that I'm going to be a bit more mechanical. I work within these big uh, systems, even though it's for the good of other people. Um, what, what, disconnect, what is disconnected? There are emotions. And we cannot, as, a, as humanitarian workers, as development workers, as politicians, for me, say that we're working for the development of human capital if we forget that we're human to begin with. If we forget that in our work, it's not about rhetoric and just policies and, and data, all of this is not neutral. It is colored by people. It is colored by people being seen, people being in at the center of solutions, that people have dignity, they have voice, that it is their emotions, their dreams, their heart, their livelihood, their physicality, that enables us to even have these systems that fight for development, um, capital, human capital development, that fight for peace, right? And so what's really important in all of this, and I love the fact that you can bring politicians, but I, it's not just politicians, it's these stoic, stoic, inhumane, corrupt people. It's all of us sitting here, how we perform every single day in our various fields. When we come together and we're able to unveil that a little bit and allow the humanity to really uh, come out in our work, it sips into how we go about developing and designing tech systems that are more human-centered. Um, it, it, it influences how we decide we want to express ourselves through the canvas, through, 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 through an instrument, through voice. It, it comes out, um, like the gentleman was saying, when you talk about mediation, understanding that the person in front of you is a person, is a father, is a husband, is it this? How do you really get to their humanity to be able to, to achieve something? So these are some of the, the thoughts I'm having as I sit here that the idea of peace, going back to the comment, right, um, really is centered around um, acknowledging the power of vulnerability, acknowledging the power of strength, ignore, uh, of anger, of all the range of emotions, and that they're all incredibly valuable and that we show up with them to be able to connect with, with other people and really cultivate a world that is a lot more just um, for all of us. Thank you very much, Fatou, for this strong uh, statement. Now, picking up on what Fatou said, you know, if we think about, Gunther, you mentioned, you know, transformation, transformative power or possibilities, how to, how to penetrate to a certain extent the other side of the coin or the other world, you know, with ideas, means which popped up during the day, um, uh, in a positive way now, through emotions, through paintings, through whatever kind of performances. I mean, do we have, now not just the three, four of us present on this uh, panel, but as a community and as networks, do we have means or ways how to promote such steps forward? Or it's more talking and um, uh, separate worlds? No, I think we have the means. I mean, the meeting now in Geneva is maybe too short, but I'll give you an example. Uh, when we had the first ceasefire agreement in South Sudan, we brought all the main guys, you know, uh, the, the really the big shots, to the Swiss mountains, to Birkenstock. And we had a kind of conclave there for many days, and if not weeks, we brought them together, we negotiated, and the context was extremely important. So the landscape, uh, the forest walks, uh, like in arms control, by the way, in, in the 1980s, um, the food, music, all kinds of things to bring people together uh, to create uh, an atmosphere of, of understanding, of talking, of using this, this kind of positive vibrations of everything together to bring them to sign a ceasefire agreement. And at the end, they did it. You know, John Garang and others, they were there, and so it worked. And I think th the context was extremely important. By the way, also the Oslo process in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine uh, for many years was kept more or less secret. But they had this in the fjords of Norway, they had these talks, walking, going out to the landscape, to the fjords, this and that. 
and it created really a lot of trust and confidence. So we do have the means. And what is quite important nowadays, and maybe this is the reason why the big shops quite often do not participate in the negotiations. They, they send the chief negotiators at a technical level. And they can block it from uh, at home with a phone call or this kind of re-entry problem, as we call it. You know, you agree on the table, you go home, and your bosses, they say, what this kind of nonsense we never sign. So it is really important to bring the real decision makers also to the table and not only waste the time with, with chief negotiators. Because, and we have seen this also with Georgia and Russia, how easily you can then block everything. And maybe a last example, yes, in, in Geneva, with uh, the Geneva talks, we worked a lot to bring the Georgians and the Abkhaz to some other place, you know, outside of Geneva, to the mountains, to create this atmosphere, to bring them together without the Russians. It almost worked, but at the last day we got a phone call by the Russian uh, head of delegation, Deputy Foreign Minister, said no meeting in the Swiss Alps and no meeting without Russia. Mm -hmm. Full stop. Thank no, you. you. See how <coughs> Thank you. I mean, one... <laughs> we, 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 we don't have the time now to move on uh, along that track, but I mean, what you said is very interesting, but if we look at the respective conflicts, things didn't develop perfectly. I mean, the Middle East, South Sudan, Abkhazia, and there, I mean, the question then would be, I guess, you know, I mean, what does it mean in terms of the level of the population? We had the preceding panel, we had the emerging debate on the role of civil society and how also these elements can, can you know, be diffused to, to, to other parts of the populations and of, of stakeholders in this regard. But mm. I was mm. told I should move to questions and I'm moving to questions and one uh, I think we want to start with, it's addressed primarily to Omaid but also to the other panelists and it runs like do you think this co-creation you mentioned before, Omaid, can also have similar emotional and positive effects if it is conducted in digital or virtual spaces? In the case of communities who just, now not thinking about COVID, uh, other reasons, communities who do not have the possibility to, to meet. Um, probably yes, uh, because there has been cases where you can um, co-create or perform uh, musical instruments uh, could be part of, uh, you could play the same song or the same orchestra in different countries uh, mm -hmm. through Zoom. Could be happening, you could be doing art therapy sessions through uh, digital networks, people sitting in this room doing, talking about their emotions and talking about subjects which are important and could be done in other parts of uh, uh, the world as well. But I'm not sure because I've never assessed its impact, how it will be, because as uh, Fatu was mentioning, this human connection and looking each other in the eye and, and that embracing each other and, and, uh, and then putting a face to those stories, uh, I, I think it's more important when you're in the same space and then it has uh, more impact, I would say. But hmm. probably it's possible. Ranka. I, I, I think our perceptions of spaces will also change in time, right? I think we are still generations that are not digital natives. And we talked yesterday, we had a really interesting discussion over dinner around this. These things will evolve. Mm -hmm. And even now I see like Fatu, we hear you, we see you. <laughs> Maybe I should, I don't know where I should look so you can see <laughs> me as well, but this is already transformational, right? Mm -hmm. This is more inclusion because we want to have more people at the table, even though physically we are not here. I, I hope this is a message for organizers as well. I really think hybrid events should be the way to go. We want to hear people from other parts of the world who are not here from for many different reasons, not only COVID, let's be honest. I mean, Global South is has so many obstacles to be at the table. So in that sense, I think we, I, 
I would love us to be open to creating new types of spaces as well. I also agree, like I'm, I'm that type of person who, who loves sharing physical, but I'm also thinking and being open, trying to discover new places where we can connect on, on a different level. And I'm kind of convinced that with newer generations, this will come naturally and people will be able to co-create and, and connect virtually yeah. as well. By the way, Branka, um, Fatu sees exactly the picture you see down there on the left corner. So I mean, before <laughs> this, she was seeing you very well. Fatu, what do you think about this point? Really quickly, I took it twofold. Um, the first one being absolutely we can co-create. I'm a big believer in collaboration, cross-divisional, cr uh, across multidisciplinary uh, collaboration. And we see on the continent um, the impact of Me Too, Me Too movement being in the U.S. sparked, and we saw its ramifications, like its ripples across the world. Um, you know, I'm sitting in Sierra Leone. We were fighting violence against women must end, and all across the continent, there were, we were collaborating with people. With women, activists, men, policymakers I had never met before via WhatsApp, text messages, um, going on Zoom calls. This idea of space and time just shrunk because we had a common goal across our, our subjective con um, context. We wanted to solve an issue and we're learning from one another. Um, and of course, once again, um, we are what we would call an elite set of people because we had access to these types of tools. But I really love the comment around space, right? If we just think about social media, Facebook, how it's connected long lost friends for many years and, and you feel like you have a community, whether real or not. Um, so so the, the distance, the idea of distance is definitely shrinking and movements, transnational movements, um, um, revolutions in terms of uh, protests are happening on all types of subvertive platforms, on digital platforms, that we can see on the black net, on WhatsApp, which is huge in so many communities um, and other platforms, people are finding ways to connect. The second way I took the question is, can we co-create digitally? I always say, you know, for me in the work that I've done in order to produce uh, tech products, I needed to co-create with people who were not like me, who don't speak like me. It had to be a diverse set of people in discipline, in race, in religion, in background. And we would come together and basically design ideas or work together to, to solve problems collectively with similar tools to ensure that the product, the digital or virtual or tech product we're producing could really be applicable to many people around the world. And therefore space and time shrinks all of a sudden because we're also working together for the common good. Thank you very much, Fatu. Now, there is also the option for question in the room with the local survivors. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there is also a microphone, I guess. Yes, I see it. Any, any questions in the room? No immediate need for questions in the room. So let me, you know, as a moderator, I always have questions. But just know that you <laughs> would have the possibility to, to, um, uh, to ask questions. Um, I see two hands. You see two hands? Oh, yes. It's sorry, hard. you see. <laughs> you just needed more time. Please, please. Yeah, sorry, I needed some time. <laughs> um, I have a question in regards of mediation because um, digital mediation, is that possible? Yeah. Digit I okay. Mean, human connection and, yeah. Yeah. Digital mediation? I mean, to understand you correctly, you mean do, do, doing yeah. mediation Through. online, not mediation about digital problems, yeah? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that would be another <laughs> issue, yeah? yeah? A new field I for think, me. I yeah. think uh, at least uh, uh, partly it's possible. What we experienced in the last two years with Cameroon, we could not really meet all the actors, all the uh, diaspora leaders. They are spread all over the world. So we had a lot of Zoom conferences with different actors, bringing them together even Zoom seminars, etc., etc. So it was, in a way, much better than we thought, and it was possible. And immediately, sometimes, we could react, we could bring one group together, 
They had a chairman in the US and a vice chairman in China and the third person in Berlin. Uh, so with traveling would have been impossible you know, to come together in a due time frame. So with Zoom, we could interact in a way much more the last two years than we would have done through real traveling. And in that sense, it was a preparation of the field of mediation, but it worked quite well. And I would say also some meetings about, let's say, elements of a ceasefire could be done also uh, with an with a online conference. Thank you. There was another question uh, over there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, fascinating uh, panel and debate again. I'm wondering, um, in an earlier panel, we also spoke about emotions and the problem of uh, mainly dealing with representatives, political representatives, in a peace mediation process or setting. And the question, what, it is what is it worth, or what is the impact of dealing with their emotions? So obviously, uh, this leads to, the, or this backs the question then, uh, can work on emotions with larger constituencies, with broader audiences, in any way be linked uh, to the work in the track one process, even the political process that we see. And for me <coughs> now, listening to you, the question has popped up, so what's the role of art perhaps in this? What's the role of uh, yeah, these different tools in it? And I think you've elaborated already a little bit on it, but maybe if you, if you want to uh, focus it again on that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. Fatu, would you like to start? No, <laughs> I just I wanted to bring you to the point where you would say no, <laughs> once, you know, too. So um, uh, larger constituencies, emotions, mediation processes. Um, well, I, I, I can go at it specifically on the part of the art. So when, when we started Art Lords, maybe I could go with, with the examples of the work we did. Uh, the idea was that eventually the work that we are doing contributes to a peaceful Afghanistan. So whatever work we are doing in terms of uh, uh, painting murals, doing street theater, uh, producing animations and movies uh, for the larger audience, for the whole of Afghanistan, and showing the diversity, the empathy, and, and promoting kindness, and it eventually will change attitudes and behaviors and will create a platform where people will come and talk to each other, understand each other, and also put themselves in the shoes of other people, seeing that if you're in the south of the country, you're from another ethnic group, there's problems same as you in the other parts of the, the, the country, which is a very different ethnic group. So the, the idea, the whole idea was that eventually our art, uh, with, while engaging people and using multi-mediums, from painting to animations to movies and using the power of social media and also going to these provinces will eventually lead us to more understanding about peace. It will pave the way and create an environment where people would um, accept each other and talk to each other. So that was the idea, um, which we worked for eight years. Uh, and I saw some, some results. I saw that people, there was a lot of critical thinking, people were asking questions, there were more empathy and understanding and more kindness towards each other. But eventually what happened with, with, with August 15 when the Taliban came, so somehow I realized that whatever we were doing was somehow uh, not really working. Uh, so that in that sense, there is an opportunity that you can use multi-mediums, and especially with the art, that you could reach more people because what I realized was that people trust this new medium. Like they're fed up with mm. so much fake news and misinformation that comes from radios, newspapers, from the TV, mainstream media. So once you have a new tool, which is art, and you're delivering messages through artivism and activism through art, they trust it more. So they're more receptive to your message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Branka? I, it just, yeah, I just wanted to reflect a bit on, on both questions, actually, and then the, the, the response as well, because we are mixing a little bit now, because 
of course, we are talking about the high-level negotiations, right? And the, the uh, discussions and the dialogue that politicians are making, which is very, very complicated. And this is why we have mediators, right? It's not, I, I, I don't think we have a magical, like a silver bullet solution, you know? We will just make the, the negotiation processes be, no, they are complicated. What I would like us to also uh, uh, note is that this, this is only part of the process, right? Even if it's successful, if we have this agreement signed, there are still communities, populations that have to live peace, right? And, and quite often, and you know that yourselves, many of these uh, uh, like contracts will stay, stay signed only on the paper. There is a huge work to be done in the communities afterwards. And this is this part of, of, of uh, uh, peace and peace building that we need to also be worried about. And now I also want us to think not only what comes after the negotiations are done, but maybe what comes before we even go into the conflict. Right? We usually, when we talk about peace, we think about wars, and and we are, of course, this is the the, the priority to stop the violence, to stop wars, to stop conflicts. But building peace starts much before that, right? P positive peace concept. So this is the part where we need to also think about utilizing all of, all of these tools. So art doesn't come only after the conflict or during the conflict, mediation as well, being able to have a discourse, a discussion, then also using the, the technology and the, the technological tools. So um, yeah, I think this is also a very important part of um, Thank peace you. building. Thank you, Branka. I think this was a, a very nice statement we would all agree with, which makes it an ideal point to wrap up the discussion <laughs> at this moment. I actually intended to have, you know, this uh, a little bit two fronts on, on um, uh, more the tech side and more the art side, and we ended up being a, a art-dominated panel. You, you didn't know is, that you put three <laughs> artists <laughs> on <laughs> the which is, <laughs> which is absolutely, absolutely <laughs> fine, and it was very, very interesting. And I, I would like to, to, to thank you for this uh, very open, frank, uh, uh, natural kind of, of exchange. Thank you very much.